My name is Stephen Rubin. I am the Grand Treasurer of the Grand Lodge of the State of New York and the proud publisher of Craftsman Online. Before we begin, please give your attention to our Grand Chaplain, Right Worshipful Wainwright McKinsey Sr., Grand Chaplain and a member of Excelsior Lodge Number 1177, First Kings Masonic District for this evening's invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. My brothers and companions and friends and well wishes, the Grand Lodge of the State of New York, grace and peace to you. Encouraged by the words of scripture, which says that behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We are encouraged to offer a prayer at this time as we commence these proceedings. Let us pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, the Supreme Architect Divine of the universe, giver of all that is good and gracious. We thank you for this glorious day that you have given to us and for this opportunity to come together in love and fellowship to celebrate the 267th anniversary of the birth of our brother and companion, Robert Burns. As indeed, there are others uh, throughout the world who are observing uh, this milestone. We thank you for the life, uh, the witness, the ministry of our brother, the Bard. And as we are guarded here under these very difficult circumstances and unusual circumstances, we are nevertheless grateful that we can gather and offer praise and thanksgiving to you uh, for our brother Robert Burns. And as we proceed uh, in this night's program, we ask you to guide those who are presenters and bless those of us who are hearers. And may all that we say and do be pleasing in your sight to your glory and the welfare of our fellow man in general. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, which stands one nation on the God, under God indivisible. indivisible, with liberty and liberty, justice, justice for all. For all. For all. My brothers, ladies, and guests, Craft, Craftsman Online is a New York State initiative by Brothers for Brothers, connecting brethren with leadership development, Masonic education, and celebrating the history of New York Freemasonry and the special men who have served and continue to serve our gentle craft. The experiences, comments, opinions, and views shared during this program are of those individual Freemasons and do not reflect the official position of a Grand Lodge concordant body, appendant body, or Masonic authority. I would also like to add that we pray for our Grand Master and all those who suffer from this pandemic, all those who have been lost, and all those left behind. We also pray for the health and well-being of our Grand Lecturer, Rich Friedman. As a reminder, tonight's presentation, as all presentations, um, will be recorded and uploaded to our website, craftsmanonline.com, for playback just click on the Masonic Talks link. Before we begin tonight's program, I want to introduce two new initiatives I'm very excited about. Craftsman's Chronicles, an oral history project. I present Worshipful Brother Terry Macaron of Kinnikwat and Riverhead Lodges in the Southern Masonic District. Brother Terry?
Brother Terry, you have to unmute yourself. Did unmute my, I did unmute myself. Somebody muted me back. Sorry about that. Brothers, good evening. Good evening. This project is an effort to safeguard and memorialize the thoughts, stories, and remembrances of our Masonic brethren for posterity. As our ancient operative ancestors built glorious cathedrals upon foundations of stone, so too are the lodges of speculative Freemasonry built upon foundations of, of the experiences and efforts of our most senior brothers. Although we are advised in ritual to seek out these brothers so that we might learn from them and hear their stories, we too often fail in this task. And in failing, we lose their singular experiences and reminiscences forever. Thus, in order to preserve their knowledge, memories, experiences, and advice, this project will endeavor to create a database of their recorded history, their singular chronicle, so that it might be preserved for posterity. We need your help to act as facilitators and be the portal through which our brothers provide their stories. Facilitators will seek those brothers from within their lodges and districts and encourage them to offer their voices. Your brothers at Craftsman Online will work with you on the technical aspects and suggested lines of discussion, but where the conversation goes will be entirely up to you and the brother being interviewed. Until pandemic restrictions are eased, we will restrict the project to virtual interviews and utilize our Zoom platform for hosting and recording these conversations. Alternatively, a willing brother may choose to create his own audio or videotape in the privacy of his home and then provide a copy for the project. Upon the pandemic's end, we will be able to meet with the brothers in their home or in lodge and conduct the interview in a more personal setting. Once a sufficient number of recorded histories are submitted and thereafter edited, we anticipate compiling a series of collected works for future broadcast. The unedited versions will be further posted on the craftsmanonline.com website for all to view. For those brothers wishing to memorialize their stories, or for those who are willing to act as facilitators and editors, please contact us at craftsmanonlinenys at gmail.com. Thank you, brothers. Thank you so very much, uh, very much, with, with Brother Terry. Um, the next pro new program we are introducing this evening is our reading club. We call it the Craftsman's Reading Room. I present Worship Brother Tom Perpy from George Washington Lodge in the 5th Manhattan District. Brother Tom? Uh, thank you, Ray Worshipful. Uh, good evening, brethren, ladies, and friends of the craft. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm excited to announce this new initiative that we're undertaking in connection with the Craftsman Online Project. Um, there's a silver lining in every dark cloud, and uh, one of the ones to come out of the COVID-19 pandemic and public health crisis was this connection of brethren virtually. Um, and the genesis of this idea really um, was the participation in a cherished George Washington tradition of uh, bringing together brethren outside of the lodge um, to discuss a Masonic reading um, and share uh, in the esoteric exchange of ideas and uh, suppositions. So the George Washington Fellowcraft Club, uh, which is named the Blueskin Fellowcraft Club after George Washington's horse, uh, has been doing this for a number of years. And when we started meeting virtually, uh, we received a lot of interest from brethren in, in lodges uh, that are inside and outside of our district who had heard of the club and wanted to participate. And Right Worshipful Ruben approached me with the idea to bring this to a broader audience. Um, we recognize that there's a need for this uh, in corners of the state that are more remote and far flung than the Fifth Manhattan District. Uh, brethren might not have the opportunity to gather together uh, on a regular basis and have the sort of experience that we do. Um, so the idea is to share that uh, through a virtual platform with brethren from around the state. Um, so we'll, beginning, we'll be beginning this venture uh, in February on, uh, let me make sure I have the date, right? February 11th. And um, the beginning, we'll be doing more or less a panel. Um, we will uh, have and some usual guests of uh, the George Washington Masonic Reading Group uh, lead a discussion on a ritual, on a piece of reading 
That reading is uh, Wilmshurst um, on the meaning of masonry, chapter five of that book. It's in the public domain and available at no charge. Um, so brethren can download it and read it in anticipation of the discussion. Um, brethren will be able to raise their hand and ask questions and uh, the moderator uh, will respond to them or direct the questions to members of the panel uh, as the case may be. Down the road, we hope to open up the discussion uh, and make it more accessible to participating brethren. Um, so that's something that we're looking forward to. Uh, the first meeting will be moderated uh, a little more heavily. Um, of course, we'll uh, be digitally tiled by uh, an ABLE uh, administrator. Um, there will be ground rules for the discussion, obviously, to make sure that um, nothing is divulged that shouldn't be in a virtual forum. Um, but uh, as with the, uh, the inspiration for this idea, which was the reading group that we have in George Washington, of course, all ideas are welcome. Um, the discussion is uh, free flowing and meant to stimulate and engage the intellects of the brethren. Um, and it's something that we really cherish and we look forward to bringing to a broader audience to all of you brethren. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Tom. Um, the information for this um, new initiative will be also on the craftsmanonline.com um, website. And um, rest assured, we'll be getting this information out further to the, the broader New York State um, grand jurisdiction. Um, my brothers, in, the, in introducing the brothers, you may have noticed I have identified the brothers' lodges and districts because I am proud of the geographical makeup of those brothers presenting this evening. Um, they represent a cross-section from around our state, representing 20 lodges and 15 districts, a number of whom are worshipful masters of lodges that traditionally hold burned suppers. I thank them for their participation, and I thank you for your attendance. I believe at this point we're up to approximately 169 um, um, individuals attending on this Zoom, and we're live on Facebook as well. So thank you so much for, for attending. Um, I also want to thank the brothers who have stepped up in such a big way to make Craftsman Online more than a thought. So when you see the name Craftsman Online, don't think of it as some generic entity. Craftsman Online is me, it's you, it's brother Michael Arce from the Old 17th, it's worship brother Ron Seafried from the Suffolk Masonic District, brother Joe Cavallero from the Onondaga District, it's Todd Paderek from the Erie Masonic District, and Anthony Prizia from the Mid-Hudson Masonic District and an army of brothers from around the state, your brothers and mine, who simply want to share more Masonic light. And Craftsman Online is also Brother Nathan Tweedy, Junior Warden of Delaware River Lodge, Senior Deacon of Otsego Lodge in the Central Leather Stocking District, and was not only Craftsman Online's co-history editor along with Worship Ron Seafried, but he's our Master of Ceremonies whose passion for everything Scottish and everything burns has been a driving force for this project. My brothers, ladies, and friends, I present you, Brother Nate Tweedy. Brother Nate. Thank you so much, Right Worshipful Reuben. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, as you know, 2020 and 2021 are a bit interesting due to uh, COVID-19 and uh, us moving everything virtual, including Burns Nights. I know I usually go to at least one Burns Night every year. I hope most of you do as well. If not, welcome to your first or first in a while Burns Night. Obviously, it will be a bit different from the tradition as we are virtual. That being said, some of our uh, issue, uh, some of our presentations are pre-recorded. Others will be done live. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, we won't run into any tech issues. If we do, bear with us and we'll roll right through them. That uh, all coming together. So let's Start with a, a Burns Night tradition and let's pipe in the haggis. Roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs>
Therefore, your honest son say face, great chieftain o' the pudden race. About them all you attack your place, pinch, tripe or fair. Will are you worthy o' a grace as long as my heir? The groaning treacher there you fill, your herbies like a distant hill. Your pen would help to mend the mill in time of need. Well, through your pores, the dew distills like amber bead. His knife, see rustic labour decked, and cut you up where any slicked. Trenching your gushing entrails bricked like on a ditch. And then, oh, oh, what a glorious sect! Warm, reeking, rich. Then horn for horn they stretch and strive, till take the headmost down they drive, till all their wheels swally, kites blow eye, or bent like drums. The old good man may slight to rive, the sidekick comes. Is there that o'er his French ragout? Or Olio that would stall a sou, or fricassee with macro spew, with perfect scunner, looks down with sneering, scornful view on sick a dinner. Poor devil, see him, o'er his trash, as feckless as a withered rash, his spindle shank a good whip lash, he's never knit. Through bloody flood or field to dash, oh, how unfit! But mark the rustic haggis fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread, clapping his wally, neither blade he'll make it whistle, and legs and arms and heeds will sned like taps of thistles. Your powers but mack mankind your care, and dish them out a bill of fare. All oh, Scotland wants nae skinking wear that chops and luggies. But if you wish her a grateful prayer, gie her a haggis. Ladies. Gentlemen, brothers, the haggis. Sorry, I muted myself. To the haggis. <laughs> ah. To the haggis. <laughs> so that was uh, Bellowcraft Brother. Uh, Andrew Pringle. Now, Andy Pringle is a member of my lodge, Delaware River Lodge 439 in Delhi, New York, in the Central Leather Stocking District. And uh, due to uh, the lack of degree work, poor brother Andy has been a fellow craft for over 13 months now, uh, even though he's quite ready to, to move on to becoming a master mason. So I really want to thank Andy. And Andy, are you in here? If you are, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, uh, give the, uh, since you gave the address, feel free to give a few words. I don't see you, but he might be in here somewhere. All right, I don't think Andy's in here. So we will then move on. Um, so since we've had the toast, time for the traditional Selkirk grace. This will be done by Right Worshipful Herbert Maine, Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge in New York and member of Coble Skill Lodge number 349 of the Central Leather Stocking District. Thank you, Nate. Some hae meat and canna eat, and some wad eat that want it, but we hae meat and we can eat, and say the Lord be thank it. All right. Thank you, Right Worshipful, and one of my favorite graces, short, sweet, and to the point. <laughs> uh, so traditionally, uh, it's said that
uh, Burns said this uh, at, a, at a dinner done in his honor in Selkirk, thus the name. It does go by several other names, uh, but uh, interesting that Robert Burns, who usually is quite flowery with his words, is so quick when it comes to the grace. I wonder if there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving right along. Uh, this is a traditional part of a Burns night dinner called the immortal Robert Burns. Uh, so that being said, I'm gonna say a few words about the Baird. Robert Burns was born to a poor family in Ayrshire, Scotland, in Scotland's Southwest. I'm sure his parents never expected that their son would go on to be voted greatest Scot, as he was by STV viewers in 2009. That people around the world would bring in the new year by singing his song, Auld Lang Syne, the third most recognizable song in the English speaking world. Or that there would be more statues around the world dedicated to their son than anyone else, minus religious figures, the queen, Victoria, and Christopher Columbus. Of these many uh, Robert Burns statues, one is located in Central Park in New York City, and one in Washington Park in Albany. While stories of men rising from poverty to change the world are still rare, it is far more common today than in 1759 when Burns was born. Burns was a man at the right place and time. The Scottish Enlightenment was a driving force in changing the way many in Europe and the New World viewed government, the rights of man, and challenged traditional hierarchies with science, reason, and the arts. Burns was certainly a man of the times. While he may have started writing poetry to impress the ladies, his work, his work showed exactly what a man of the Enlightenment was. He often wrote of political affairs and the equality of man, including several works speaking out against slavery. His works also show a pride of Scotland, despite the formation of the United Kingdom a generation prior to his birth. And his work reflects the themes of many great minds of the Scottish Enlightenment. However, Burns certainly was not a choir boy. As he, at the time, he was quite well known, is still known today to have been a womanizer and overindulged in the drink. Nevertheless, brother Robert Burns, like all of us, was a rough stone being worked into a more perfect shape to fit its intended purpose. So with that, ladies, gentlemen, brothers and friends, to Robert Burns. And with that, our next presenter actually, I believe, is currently in lodge. So I'm not quite sure who's jumping in in his pace, place, but uh, it's supposed to be uh, <laughs> um, worshipful brother Joseph Pagan. Uh, of actually, 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 brother, uh, brother Joe had to leave. Um, he, in his stead, is right worshipful brother Remington, um, who will be um, giving the toast at this time. Brother Remington, unmute yourself, yes, please. Yes, brethren. I'm here. Or as we like to call him, right worship brother Ponytail. <laughs> uh, bear with me because this is cold. No Spartan tube, no attic shell, no liar aeolian I awake. Tis liberty bold, note I swell. Thy harp, Columbia, let me take. See gathering thousands while I sing, a broken chain exulting bring and dash it in a tyrant's face and dare him to his very beard and tell him he no more is feared, no more the despot of Columbia's race. A tyrant's proud insults brave, they shout a people freed, they hail an empire saved. Where is man's godlike form? Where is that brow erect and bold that I that can unmoved behold the wildest rage, the loudest storm, the air created fury dared to raise? Avant you, Catliff, servile base that tremblest at a despot's nod, yet crouching under the iron rod, canst laud the hand that struck the insulting blow. Art thou man's imperial line? Dost boast that countenance divine? Each skulking features answers no. But come ye sons of liberty, Columbia's offspring have 
brave is free in danger's hour still flaming in the van you know and dare that maintain the royalty of man alfred on thy starry throne surrounded by the tuneful choir the the bards that erst have struck the patriot lyre thou rouse the freedom britain's soul of fire no more thy england own dare injured nation great design to make detested tyrants bleed thy england's extricates and glorious deed beneath banners waving every pang of honor braving england and its thunder calls thy tyrants causes that ours accursed net how did the fiends rejoice and hell through her confines raise the exulting voice that our which saw the generous english name linked with such damned deeds of the everlasting shame the calenia the what thy wild heaths among famed for the martial deed the heaven taught song to thee i turn with swimming eyes where is that soul of freedom fled and mingled with thy mighty dead beneath that hollowed turf where wallace lies hear it not wallace in thy bed of death ye babbling winds in silence sweep disturb not ye heroes sleep nor give the coward secret breath it is ancient Caledonian form, firm as the rock, resistless in, as a storm. Show me the eye which shot immortal hate, blasting the despot's proud, proudest bearing. Show me that arm which nerved thy th with thundering fate, crushed usurpation's boldest daring. Dark quenched as yonder sinking star, no more than a glance lightens afar that palsied arm no more worlds on the waste of war. Thank you so much. Not an easy poem to read on the, uh, on the blind. So thank you so much, right worshipful ponytail. Um, uh, so uh, that was the ode to General Washington, uh, ode for General Washington's birthday. Uh, obviously George Washington, as many as you know, is, uh, was a brother Freemason as well. And this was written um, in 1795, I believe, 1796, somewhere in there. 74, I apologize, 1794, this poem was written for Brother Washington by Brother uh, Burns. Staying with the theme of, of national heroes, uh, we're going to move to Right Worshipful Stephen Rumpf, Grand Organist of the Grand Lodge of New York and member of Kane Lodge, number 454 of the Fourth Manhattan District, playing. Scots will hey. Sorry, right, we're, we're 0 for 2 here. Apparently, brother uh, Stephen is having some technical difficulties as well. So we're just going to move right on uh, to our next song, uh, a beautiful song, which actually uh, brother uh, Randy will discuss in his video. And this is from Right Worship, or not Right Worship, sorry, just brother Brandy Miratello, who is, uh, um, who is the senior warden of Oneonta Lodge number 466 in Oneonta, New York and is in the Central Leather Stocking District. And with that, Brother Randy Miratello. Hey all, cheers. Happy birthday, Roger Burns. And uh, Nathan asked me if I would uh, play a Robert Burns song. So I got looking through them and I found this one. It's called Soldier's Return. It's a 
sweet tale of a soldier going off to do his duty, come home to find his true love waiting for him. And not only is she waiting for him, but now she's rich too. So it doesn't get much better than that. So cheers to you, Robbie Burns, and cheers to all of you. I'll do my best with this one here. Deadly blast was blown, and my gentle peace be turning. Harmonious we bear for the land, and morning wet oh morning. I left the lines in tented fear, but lang I dread a larger. Humble nags have all my will. For an honest soldier, leave that heart beat in my breath. My hand unstained with hunger. For best to chose your hand again. Cheery, I did wonder. Out upon the banks of coil, out upon my Nancy, I found upon the witching smile. I caught my youthful fancy. Length that reached the body again. Early life I sported as the mill and twist and fall when empty off I courted the spot I have my demand and by the mother's well turn me round to hide the flood. And in my eye was swelling All well, through old was I sweet lad Sweet as your hawthorn blossom Oh happy, happy may he be That steers to thy bosom My first night I fell to gain and fain by the ledger I've served my king country lay Take pity on a soldier To 
Cheers to you all anyways, and let's have a great night together. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Brother Randy, for that. Uh, Randy is uh, pretty well known here in my local area. Uh, him and his band uh, pretty well known. So that being said, let's uh, keep on rolling on with our agenda this evening. Our next speaker will be up several times Right Worshipful Daniel Ekman from Joshua Lodge number 890 of the 7 Masonic, 7th Masonic District, 7th Manhattan District. There we go, Manhattan. It, it's an upstate thing. It's hard for me to say. Uh, so uh, the 7th Masonic District, Brother Right Worshipful uh, Daniel Ekman. Thank you, Brother. Um, hope everyone's having a good time so far. Um, so as those of you who've attended Burns Suppers in the past, probably know these evenings usually involve some sort of a whiskey lecture and then a whiskey tasting. So structurally, what we're gonna be doing tonight is I'll be giving a mini whiskey lecture now, along with the first taste for those of you who are joining us in the flight. And then over the course of the evening, we'll be jumping in with four more samples. Um, so when we talk about whiskey and when we talk about Scotch whiskey, you're just gonna get a little bit of the, um, the verbiage out of the way at first. Whiskey is a very broad strokes, vague term. It's no more specific than the word wine. So you'll encounter people in your life who say, I don't drink whiskey, I drink scotch, or I don't drink bourbon, I drink whiskey, because it says whiskey on the Jack Daniels bottle, and they're pretty sure that Jack Daniels is the only one that is just whiskey. No, whiskey is anything that's fermented from grain and then distilled. That's it, aged for any period of time in any kind of wood. That's the broad strokes definition of whiskey. When we talk about scotch, because this is a Burns night, we're talking about scotch whiskey in particular, the whiskey has to be made in Scotland, distilled and aged and bottled in Scotland. It has to be at least three years old. And when we say at least three years old, that means every part of any of it, blended or otherwise, must be at least three years old. And if there's an age statement on the bottle, that's the youngest thing of all the things that went in, which is why Johnny Walker Blue doesn't have an age statement on it because they don't want you to know that the grain that goes into it is nine years old and the malt that goes in is 60 years old. Um, so what is Scotch whiskey beyond that? Um, the Scots have been making whiskey since about the 14th century. The Irish beat them by a good two centuries. And they started in the 14th century with the trade that was coming up from Spain. The, uh, the Catholic monks in Spain were trading with the Irish and they brought 
the Alembic stills from Spain that they'd been using for brandy up to Ireland. And the Irish immediately said, well, we can't grow grapes here. So we can't make brandy, but we have lots of beer. And let's see what we can do with that. And they started distilling beer. And a couple centuries later, the technology made its way up to Scotland. And now the Scots were distilling beer. And it was pretty bad stuff for the first several hundred years. It was rough. It wasn't until they started aging it that it really got drinkable in any particular way. And nobody aged it because why in God's name would you age it? You made it. It's booze. You can get drunk off it. Drink it today. It's here today. Let's drink it today. And really, it was uh, it, it was the uh, the trade currents all up and down the sides of the Atlantic when whiskey would spend three months on a ship and it would get there better than when it left port. And it took them a fair amount of time to realize it wasn't the sea air that was doing it. It was actually the time sitting in the wood because everything that got transported got transported in a barrel. So that changed everybody's minds. And now they were distilling and letting it sit. And we got whiskey that started to be aged for three months, six months, a year, two years was ancient back in the day. But that was the way things chugged along for several centuries. And there wasn't any big technological change until in 1831, an Irish taxman named Anus Coffey invented the column still. This was the first time we had a non-pot still. And that's very, very, very important, more for Scotch than it is for Irish, because the Irish wouldn't use it at first. But the Scots right away said, wait, we can make whiskey faster for cheaper, we're in. And they started making grain whiskey instead of malt whiskey. And uh, about 60 years after that, they figured out that they could blend the two of them together. And that was the watershed moment where whiskey really became for everybody. Um, so now we've got a distilled product of fermented grain and everybody knows there's blended scotch and then there's malt scotch. And the difference is there's malt scotch, which has to be made from 100% malted barley. You can't use any grains other than malted barley. And it has to be made in a pot still. That's when you make malt scotch whiskey. If it's single malt, that means it's the product of only one distillery. Three of the five whiskeys we're having tonight are blended malts. So you take multiple single malts and blend them, and then you've got blended malt. It ceases to be single. Then you've got grain whiskey, whiskey that's made from anything other than just malted barley, typically in a column still, which is rather than a pot still is basically a tea kettle. And you bring it to a boil and the steam comes off the top. Column still, big, huge, tall, literal column where the spirit is blasted up through a series of plates and becomes very delicate in flavor. And that's the idea. It happens that it makes it faster and cheaper, but the idea was to make it mild. And so blended scotch is some proportion of grain scotch and some proportion of malt scotch. And you put them together and then you've got a blend. And most blends are going to be about 75% grain, 25% malt, because that's frankly the way most people like it. It has nothing to do with price. It's just the way they want to drink. And if you think that sounds silly, think about cranberry and club soda. Cranberry and club soda doesn't taste better when you make it 80% cranberry, because that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a milder, more approachable, more refreshing beverage. And you want about a quarter of the glass to be juice and three quarters of the glass to be soda. And that's roughly the same proportion that's gonna work for your blended scotch, which 90 plus percent of the world's scotch market is for blends. And again, it's not a price-driven issue. It's a taste-driven issue. The average person off the street, if you blind taste them on malt whiskeys and blended whiskeys will choose the blend because they find it easier to drink. All right. Um, and, Scotch was sort of second to Irish in world popularity until World War II. And what happened in World War II was the US GIs who were over there came to love Scotch whiskey when they were fighting in the European theaters and then they brought it home. And that was really, Scotch had taken over a certain, to a certain extent after prohibition ended, um, but World War II was really what put it on the map. And it was the number one thing everybody was drinking until, about the 80s when the American market shifted toward vodka, but now scotch is having a, a second little bit of a heyday. Um, so the whiskeys we're going to be tasting tonight, because I don't want to talk too long about just the academics of scotch, although I'll splash a little bit of that in as we go down the line tonight. We're going to be tasting one blended scotch, three blended grains and one single malt, oh, three blended malts and one single malt. And the blended scotch that we're going to be tasting first, for those of you who are joining me, is the famous grouse. So this is the single most popular scotch in Scotland, always and forever. 
that's just what it's going to be. And it would be the most popular blended scotch. It would be the most popular whiskey in the entire UK, except every time it's about to become the most popular, Bell's drops their price by a pound and a half specifically to fight them. And then Famous Grouse gets ticked out just by that little bit. But this has been the most popular scotch in Scotland for as long as they've been making it, basically. Um, and it's a blended scotch. So it's about 75% grain whiskey. The grain whiskey, when we talk about regions in Scotland, is almost all made in the lowlands. So people talk about regional scotch differences. The lowlands is almost entirely for grain production for blending scotch. There are a couple of lowland whiskeys out there that are malt, but uh, not really enough to, to distinguish the region. So we've got 75% lowland grain, and then the malts that go into the famous grouse are Macallan, Highland Park, Glenrothes, Glen Turret, and Temdu, according to Edrington, the company that makes it. Uh, according to the owner of Glen Farkless, who I've spoken to, he sells those guys quite a lot of his whiskey. And if they're not putting it in Famous Grouse, he figures they're probably just drinking it. So odds are there's some Glen Farkless in here as well. Um, but when we talk about the flavor profile of a blend versus a malt, it's about having the flavor a little bit spread out rather than having that big concentrated hit of malt whiskey flavor. Um, you actually get to approach it a little bit more aggressively than you would approach a malt because it's not going to fight back quite as hard. It makes a big difference if you're having a casual everyday drink. And you may have noticed that I was doing a little bit of rolling on the glass here. Swirling your whiskey doesn't actually do anything for it. This isn't wine. You're not opening it with exposure to the air. However, if you roll the whiskey around the inside of the glass, you're increasing the effective surface area that you're getting the aroma from. And since most tasting happens in the nose, it's going to make a huge difference in the way you experience the scotch. Hmm. Mild, sweet, easy drinking, everyday scotch. I love it. I can't get enough of it. Um, but I think that's probably as much time as I was supposed to take for the first segment. So I'm going to pass things back to Brother Nathan and patiently wait my next turn. Slatcha. Thank you, Right Worshipful Brother um, Dan. We're looking to look forward to um, the next four segments, and then we're going to try to find our way home. Um, I, I did, you know, I, I said, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we all have everyone in their prayers who is suffering from COVID and, and, and other and other health issues. And I see on our um, um, on our uh, program tonight that not only do we have um, worship brother Mick Del, Del Val, who's going to be performing later on later on for us, who um, was is thank goodness recovering and recovered. Uh, we're in the process of recovering from COVID, so we're so happy to see him, and we're looking forward to hearing him this evening. I also want to uh, recognize Right Worship Brother Richard Morley, senior past um, Grand Warden, who is um, undergoing some cancer treatments, and of course, he is always in our thoughts and prayers. And um, if I don't mention anyone else, um, you know, it's so complicated and difficult to see everyone on the Zoom call. So I love you all, Right Worshipers, down to... Um, now, our ladies, everyone, you know, you're just also special. So don't take offense if we don't recognize you. As I said, it's very challenging to, to, um, to, to see everyone on the call. Back to you, Brother Nate. Thank you so much to everyone's Thank health. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Ooh. And uh, yeah, as far as uh, famous grouse goes, I got my master's in Scotland. And let me tell you, as a, as a grad student without a whole lot of money, didn't really want to spend the money on it. But as soon as I noticed that they were the sponsor of the Scottish national rugby team, well, that's where my funds went. So anyway, uh, on to our next speaker. Actually, it's going to be a toast. Uh, so uh, this one may sound familiar to those of you who've been to a table lodge before. You may have noticed a theme going through our, our events, our, our speakers so far. They had a theme of patriotism or pride of nation or related to something in that vein. So uh, doing the toast to the flag will be Right Worshipful Richard Newton, District Deputy Grandmaster of the Chattaqua Masonic District and member of Forest Lodge number 166. My brethren, join me in a toast to the flag. Here's to the red of it. There's not a thread of it. No, nor a shed of it. In all the spread of it. From foot to head, but heroes bled for it. Faced steel and lead for it. Precious blood shed for it, bathing it red. Here's to the white of it, thrilled by the sight of it. Who knows the right of it, but feels the might of it. 
through day and night. Womanhood's care for it, made manhood dare for it. Purity's prayer for it, keeps it so white. Here's to the blue of it, beauteous view of it, heavenly hue of it, star-spangled dew of it, constant and true. Diadem gleam for it, state stand supreme for it, liberty's beam for it, brightens the blue. Here is to the whole of it, stars, stripes, and pole of it, body and soul of it, oh, and the roll of it, sun shining through, hearts in accord for it, swear by the sword for it, thanking the Lord for it, red, white, and blue. Here, here. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, right, worshipful Newton. And uh, I haven't seen his video yet tonight. So when I saw him come on the screen, I was a little taken aback. That was fantastic. Thank you, brother, for adding an extra flair to that. All right. Um, next up, we're going to move into a more traditional aspect of some Burns Knights and an organization that Burns actually founded while still in Ayrshire, Scotland. That being said, uh, brother, worshipful brother Hunter Shelburne, of, uh, who is the worshipful master of Scotia Lodge number 834, of the 5th Manhattan District. Worshipful Shelburne. All right, um, for some reason we can't quite get him so We'll pop back to him when we can. In the meantime, we'll move on to, <laughs> aren't you going to love it? Those of you who are doing the flight, get ready for number two. Right Worshipful Dan Ekman is back. Now I'm back. Sorry about that. All right. So um, one quick note that I realize I should have given with the first dram, um, a standard whiskey flight. All together equals one drink. Those of you who are participating have received five drinks, five totally decent sized drinks. And if you drink each one over the course of the initial portion of the tasting, you're not going to get much of the depth and breadth of flavor of whiskeys three, four, and five. So you may want to just say take a third of each one at a time. That said, um, the next whiskey we're going to be tasting is actually the first in the box or actually might be the middle one in the box. It's the Spaniard. So if you look in the compass box box, um, this was originally gonna be a flight of five compass box whiskeys, except there was some confusion in acquisition and I ended up with sample box of three compass box whiskeys. So I supplemented them with two other whiskeys to get it back up to five. The Spaniard um, is a blended malt uh, made by compass box, which is owned by John Glazer. And it's all about barrels which is good because that takes us to the next part of the whiskey talk. When we talk about the barrels that Scotch is aged in, this is a critical difference between European whiskeys and American whiskeys. When we're talking about old world, new world difference, there are two major portions to it. One is the barrels and one is the weather. Nothing you can do about the weather, but the barrels that we use for whiskey in the United States by constitutional law, this was the act of Congress of 19, the Bourbon Act of the Bourbon Heritage Act of Congress of 1964, American whiskeys must be aged in first fill American white oak casks. In Scotland by law and in Ireland by tradition, they only use second fill casks, casks that have previously already held some sort of beverage alcohol. That's very important. The reason for that is if you've ever had a really dry glass of red wine, you know that the dryness of it, that that mouthfeel to it is also very familiar in bourbons. And the reason for that is that American white oak is loaded with tannin. And the tannin is the thing that makes the red wine dry. So if you don't want your whiskey to be full of tannin, you want a cask that's essentially been rinsed. So they're using previously filled casks, mostly from the bourbon guys, because the bourbon guys can only use the cask once and then it's their garbage. So they sell it to the Scots on the cheap. But in this particular case, this whiskey, the Spaniard, so named because it is a blend of multiple whiskeys aged in different types of sherry. And when we talk about the way that a sherry aged whiskey differs from a bourbon aged whiskey, 
So we've got a scotch that's aged in sherry casks instead of bourbon casks. The bigger difference is the fact that it's Spanish oak, not the fact that it was sherry rather than bourbon. And Spanish oak compared to American oak is going to give way more natural color. It's going to give a very different flavor profile, much heavier on stone fruit and chocolate and toffee rather than a big hit of vanilla and then some floral notes. Um, so this particular whiskey was made from different types of sherry butts. So you've got the Spanish oak and now you've also got the influence of the various types of sherry where you're going to find the really sweet stuff, the Olorosa and the Pedro Jimenez and also the really light stuff, the Amontillado and the Palacotado. And all of those flavors come together in this blended malt. So it's a blended malt. It's going to be a very complex flavor, but it's going to be much richer in character than the blended scotch because there's no grain component to it. Oh, that's just lovely. Very nutty, very nutty stuff. Back to you, Nathan. Thank you, Right Worshipful Ekman. So I just sent a, uh, a message in the chat for everyone. We will be doing our knobby knees contest in a little bit. If you're wearing a kilt like I am, uh, chances are your knees are showing. And uh, at some Scottish events, you'll find a knobbiest knees contest. So if you're wearing a kilt or not, you think you got some knobby knees, take a picture of them. If your spouse is there, make sure you sleep on the couch tonight if you snap a picture without their permission. But take those pictures, check the chat, uh, send it to me. It's right at my email, nathantweedy at yahoo.com. And uh, I'll be compiling them. And then we will uh, later on this evening be voting on the knobbiest knees. So uh, yeah, make sure you get in on it. It's going to be a really fun time. And you win a prize, which may or may not be real. <laughs> and with that, we're going to move on to our next, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, by Worshipful Brother Mark Curato, the Worshipful Master of Cane Lodge Number 454 of the 4th Manhattan District. And before we jump into this, remember back to when I did the immortal Robert Burns. I mentioned that he was a man of the Enlightenment. And the next two works of Burns that are going to be recited really kind of emphasize that. The first is A Man's a Man, uh, which is traditionally done either as a song or a poem. It was written as a song, uh, but quite often is recited as a poem, which it will be tonight. And uh, this is one of my personal favorite Burns songs. Uh, and it really talks about what Burns feels a man acts like and does. Uh, and it might not meet necessarily what you traditionally would expect, followed up by um, to a mountain daisy, uh, which also has some great allusions to how life is and man's place in life uh, through the allusion to or the allegory of a mountain daisy after he plows it up. That being said, uh, keep this in mind as we go through our next two Burns pieces. Again, this is by Worshipful Brother Mark Curato, Worshipful Master of Cane Lodge number 454 of the 4th Manhattan. brothers, this is Mark Corrado. I'm the current master of Kane Lodge, number 454. We're in the 4th Manhattan District. You know, each year around this time, we, uh, we have our own rather vibrant Burns Night, and it's a big regret that we can't be doing that in person this year, uh, but we're looking forward to getting together again next year in person. Uh, I'm going to recite uh, the poem, A Man's a Man, and this is a poem that if you weren't already aware that Burns was a Mason, uh, you might have suspicions based on reading this one. It's about how the true measure of a man is his uh, honesty and his character and has nothing at all to do with uh, title or wealth or rank or things like that. Um, so here it is. Is there for honest poverty that hangs his head and all that? The coward slave, we pass him by. We dare be poor for all that. For all that and all that, our toils obscure and all that. The rank is but a guinea step. The man's the gold for all that. What, though on homely fare we dine, wear rough gray tweed and all that? Give fools their silks and knaves their wine. A man's a man for all that. For all that and all that, their tinsel show and all that. 
The honest man, though ever so poor, is king of men for all that. You see that fellow called the Lord who struts and stares and all that? Though hundreds worship at his word, he's but a dolt for all that. For all that and all that, his ribbon, star, and all that, the man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at all that. A prince may make a belted knight, a marquis, a duke, and all that, but an honest man is above his might. Good faith, he must not fault that. For all that and all that, their dignities and all that, the pith and sense and pride of worth are higher rank than all that. Then let us pray that come it may and come it will for all that, that sense and worth over the earth shall take the prize and all that. For all that and all that, it's coming yet for all that, that man to man the world over shall brothers be for all that. Happy Burns Night, brothers. My brothers, I wanted to just mention that um, worshipful brother Mark and his wife are both emergency room doctors. And um, since the pandemic, they have been going nonstop. And um, I'm actually, I believe my brother Mark is, is working this evening, but he wanted to make sure that he had a presence here this night. So we're so pleased that he was able to record um, that, 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 that beautiful song. Um, back to you, brother Nate. Thank you. Sorry, slight delay there to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, thank you not only to to uh, worship brother Kurt, uh, Kurt, I can't say his last name, <laughs> Gerto, uh, but also to all of our presenters this evening who have already and are going to uh, either perform or, or recite for us. <clears throat> and that being said, uh, I'm our next speaker. So if you don't know who I am by now, you haven't been paying attention. So here we are. This is uh, uh, To a Mountain Daisy, uh, and I will be reading an updated English version just because I'm gonna have a hard time reading the Scots. So, <laughs> so here we are. Small, modest, crimson tipped flower. You have met me in an evil hour for I must crush among the dust your slender stem. To spare you now is past my power, you lovely gem. Alas, it is not your neighbor sweet, the bonny lark companion meet bending you among the dewy wet with speckled breast, then upward springing blithe to great and purpling east. Cold blew the bitter biting north upon your earthy humble birth, yet cheerfully you sparkled forth amid the storm. Scarce reared above the parent earth your tender form. The flaunting flowers our gardens yield, High sheltered woods and walls must shield, but you beneath the random shelter of clod and stone adorns the bare stubble field unseen, alone. There in your scanty mantle clad, your snowy bosom sunward spread, you lift your unassuming head in humble guise, but now the plowshare tears up your bed and lo you lie. Such is the fate of artless maid, sweet, flowerlet of the rural shade, by love simplicity betrayed and guileless trust until she like you all soiled is laid low in the dust. Such is the fate of simple bard on life's rough oceans, luckless starred, unskilled he to note the card of prudent lore till borrows rage and gales blow hard and whelm him over. Such fate to suffer worth is given, who long with wants and woes has striven, by human pride or cunning driven, to misery's brink, till wretched of every stay but heaven, he ruined sink. Even you who mourn the daisy's fate, that fate is yours, no distant date. Stern runes plowshare drives elate, full on your bloom, till crushed beneath the furrow's weight shall be your doom. And that ties in quite well, I think, with our previous reading as to more enlightenment period views of life, of man, 
and of our future. And on a happier note, because some might need to drown their sorrows after such a poem, let's have some more scotch talk. And no, chances are it will not be a Sainsbury scotch, despite how wonderful those are. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, so we're now in whiskey number three. And whiskey number three is going to serve an interesting contrast to whiskey number two. So whereas whiskey number two, the Spaniard from Cuppus Box, was a blended malt of multiple sherry aged whiskeys. Whiskey number three is going to be the Macallan 12 year old. Very familiar. Everybody who drinks scotch has had this, but many people who've had it have not really had it in context um, to understand exactly what it is that sets this whiskey apart and makes it so popular. Uh, Macallan's a single malt rather than a blended malt. And when it says 12 years old, that means that the youngest whiskey that went into it is 12 years old. And that's important because single malt is not single barrel. When you're making scotch, like any other organic process, there are going to be inconsistencies from cask to cask. Try making the exact same pot of chili twice, right? So in order to give the consumer a more consistent experience, they'll take tens or twenties or hundreds or sometimes thousands for the really lower end whiskeys of casks and vat them all together. And by blending across the course of a production run, you achieve a much more consistent outcome in the long run. So single malt whiskeys are almost never single barrel and Macallan is no exception. And in this case, it's important to remember that because the whiskey in the bottle is probably a combination of mostly 12 year old whiskey, but there's probably some 13 and a little bit of 14. And in some years there might even be some 15, especially if they had a whiskey that in the course of 15 years didn't really age as much as it normally would have. So this is a good way for them to get rid of it because if they barreled it as, if they bottled it as 15 year old, people would drink it and say, this is unimpressive. So there's a very typical tactic taken by distilleries. Now, when we talk about the wood program, McAllen famously only uses Olorosa sherry casks, not a finish. This is from beginning to end. They take all their, they, they basically buy every used barrel that comes out of Tio Pepe, and all those casks get used to age McAllen the entire time. So it's what a lot of whiskey drinkers would call a sherry bomb. All the flavors you'd associate with that type of aging are going to come into this glass. A lot of chocolate, a lot of stone fruit, cherry, toffee, that sort of thing. And it, it's not so much that it's one note as it is very focused on that particular flavor profile. So again, give that a roll. And you don't have to rinse your glass in between rounds, although you may if you want, um, unless you're having really different things, as long as you're having whiskeys in a reasonable order. I'm not trying to insult you when I tell you there's no way that you are going to be able to tell the difference between whether or not there was a drop from the previous round in your glass or not. If you had that sensitive a palate, you'd probably work in the liquor business. So give that a nose. And when you talk about the dramatic contrast between the previous whiskey, which was milder, elegant, very nutty, this is a big blast of that dark chocolate stone fruit winter toffee flavor. Cheers. And back to you, Nathan. Actually, if I just may uh, take two minutes, to, I want to just welcome um, everyone who's here with us this evening. But I want to make a make note that we have brothers visiting with us from the, the, the wonderful state of New Jersey, California, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Georgia, Maine, and the wonderful country of Bulgaria. All brothers, one and all, thank you for being here with us, bro uh, my, my brothers. Um, back to you, Brother Nate. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Moving up to our next song uh, is coming from um, uh, worshipful brother Michael Angelo. But honestly, I've known this man for a few years. I've never called him either of those. Brother Mick Delavelle, uh, who, <laughs> um, who actually just has recovered from uh, COVID-19. And uh, he his voice isn't quite back yet. So he wanted me to make sure to let you all know that uh, that's kind of where he is right now. So uh, a big thank you to Brother Mick for, Worshipful Brother Mick for taking the time to do this and as well as uh, fighting through the, the breathing issues to make sure he, he performed for us. So I don't know, I see we have Canada here as well, as well as Connecticut. So with that, uh, roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs>
I one kiss and then we say I farewell and then forever deep in heart one tears of plenty or ties and grows await thee Oh shall say that fortune grieves me while the star of hope she leaves me me and cheerful twinkle like me Dark despair round me nights me I'll never blame my part to fancy nothing could resist my love for Nancy But to see her was to love her love but her and love forever Again, that is Brother Mick Delavale uh, out of the uh, capital region of New York. And uh, you'll notice uh, he, he was wearing a bathrobe. Uh, and the reason he was wearing a bathrobe is because the tartan on there was a, uh, a black watch tartan, uh, which those of you who uh, um, are a member of my valley, the Valley of Schenectady and the Scottish Rite, um, that is our Knights of St. Andrew tartan. Uh, not gonna say it's the best, uh, clan of the Knights of St. Andrews in New York, but uh, I'm not saying it's not. So that being said, <laughs> let's move on to our next. Oh, by the way, that was not Loch Lomond, uh, as was originally planned. It was actually I Fond Kiss, which is one of Burns' more popular romantic songs. Uh, like I mentioned in uh, earlier this evening, Burns loved to write poetry for the ladies because he loved the ladies, period. And I Fond Kiss, oh, what a, what a song about love and romance. Um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> let's move on to our next, uh, and actually, right worshipful uh, Herbert Maine from Cobleskill Lodge number 342. He is the Grand Chaplain for the state of New York, or Grand Lodge of the state of New York. Uh, he is going to be coming back and doing one of my, another one of my favorite Burns poems. You might notice I have a lot of favorites. I just love Burns. Uh, but this one really shows that he, this was one of his first really popular poems and was written while he was a, uh, a farmer. Um, and uh Actually, I remember this myself. Uh, my dad's actually on right now. He, he'll tell you I didn't really help out much in the field as a kid in the farm, but I do remember seeing a very similar uh, experience uh, out in the field as a kid. So that being said, Brother Bert, back to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I don't know, am I, am I gonna be seen as well? I yeah, guess you can see me up in the corner, up on the top there. You're good to go. And also, I have to apologize. I said to a mouse because I can't read my own writing. Right, it's to a louse. Yeah, wrong, wrong ouse one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he has written both to a mouse and to a louse. Yeah. Right. So to a louse, which is one of his funnier poems. Yes. Uh, based on uh, his experiences in church watching the critter crawl around the bonnet of the woman sitting in front of him, 
and uh, he watches the motions of the critter and threatens it with insecticide and eventually realizes that people are noticing what's going on. There are others who are noticing this bug as well. And the young woman is totally oblivious to it. And she thinks the people are looking because of her lovely curls and her lovely bonnet. And then he finishes with a very famous wish that we could be self-observant enough not to make the fools of ourselves that we generally seem to be quite capable of doing. And uh, before I read this, I want to apologize for our brothers from the Scottish Lodges who are here <laughs> online because <clears throat> this is not going to sound as Scottish as I wish it would. Maine is a sept of the clan gun, by the way, so I have more reason to apologize for my ancestry. <clears throat> Without further ado. Ah, where are you going, you crowling fairly? Your impudence protects you steadily. I cannot say, but you strut rarely or gauze and lace, though faith I fear you dine but sparely on sick a place. You ugly, creeping, blasted wonner, detested, shunned by saunt and sinner, how dare you set your fit upon her, so fine a lady. Go somewhere else and seek your dinner on some poor body. Swith, in some beggar's hoffet squattle, there you may creep and sprawl and sprattle, with either kindred, jumping cattle, in shoals and nations, or horn, or bane, or door, and settle your thick plantations. Now, hold you there, you're out of sight, below the fat rules, snug and tight. Nah, faith ye yet, you'll no be right till you've got on it, the very tapmost towering height of Mrs. Bonnet. My sooth, right bald you set your nose out, as plump and grey as ony groset. Oh, for some rank mercurial roset or fell red smedum, I'd gie you such a healthy dosort. What dress you draw em? I wadna have been surprised to spy you on an old wife's flaming toy, or ablin some bit duddy boy on's wily coat. But Mrs. Fine Lonardi, fie, how dare you do it? Oh, Jenny, do not toss your head and set your beauties uh, a bread. You little ken what cursed speed the blast is making. The winks and finger ends I dread are notice taken. <sighs> Wad some power the gifty geas to see ourselves as others see us. It wad from money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lay us, and even devotion. <laughs> Sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself there. Thank you, Brother Bert, so much. Again, Bert right, worship, right worshipful Bert Main, uh, Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge in the state of New York. So thank you again, Brother Bert, for your second appearance this evening. Also, if you, if you want a voiceover, I think Bert's a good guy. He's got the perfect voice for it. Uh, moving right along to our next, also, uh, I want to say before I move on, um, is that uh, um, speaking with a Scottish accent is extremely difficult if you're not Scottish. Uh, and uh, I usually preface whenever I do a Burns night dinner. I, this is the first time I've ever read Burns in English when I'd read earlier. Usually I try to do the Scots and I always preface with when I was in Scotland, I lived there for a year. And whenever I met people, they always wanted to show me their American accent. So this is the revenge I'm enacting for that horrible California surfer dude accent. I always heard every time a Scotsman wanted to give me their American accent. So uh, yeah, so well done, Brother Bert. It's, uh, it's not easy to, uh, to tackle Scottish accents. They're quite broad, quite diverse, and quite nuanced. That being said, um, we are gonna move on. And it is now time for another Scotch tasting with Right Worshipful Ekman. So Dan, over to you. Another scotch tasting. I know, it's like there's tons of them. I love it. Oh, it has been a long night. All right, so this next whiskey that we're going to be sampling, we're going back to Compass Box. And this is a another blended malt. Um, it's, the spice tree is different. 
Um, so different that their first release actually was banned by Scotland and they had to rejigger the formula before they could re-release it because they did the one thing I said they very specifically were not allowed to. They aged it in first fill casks. And different companies have found different ways to skirt the rules and fill in first fill casks, but they just said, we're just going to age a whiskey in a first fill cask here in Scotland and blend it with the rest of our stuff and maybe no one will notice. And someone did. Um, but now they actually make the whiskey by integrating some new oak staves into the barrel heads. So you're going to get a little bit of that head of tannin in this scotch that you normally wouldn't, that's going to be a little bit more familiar to the bourbon drinking world. Also, um, when we talk about the blend here, uh, it's mostly distilleries that you definitely have not heard of because nobody bottles their whiskey straight. These are distilleries that make their whiskey almost entirely to be used for blending, which for the record, most distilleries in Scotland, most of their whiskey is used to make blends. Um, but this happens to have a very hefty portion of a whiskey called Kleinleash. And Kleinleash is a big monster of a bear from the Highlands. When we talk about what's a Western Highland whiskey, um, the really big, rich ones, rather than the milder, fruitier Glenlivet style, um, Kleinleash brings a lot to the table. So when we talk about this being called the spice tree, um, when you hear about a Scotch whiskey being spicy, it's not jalapeno spice. Uh, we're talking about baking spices. Think the things that make Christmas take, cake taste like Christmas cake. We're talking about uh, allspice and cinnamon and nutmeg, um, clove. So those flavors can become very prominent in certain Scotch whiskeys depending on the way that they're aged. And again, this one is a blend of different casks from different distilleries, generally not very heavily toasted. So you're not going to get much of the caramel flavor from the wood. You are going to get much more of a natural flavor from the wood. And when we talk about the chemical composition of wood and how that actually starts to matter, and this is not about to become a botany lecture, don't worry, but we could do that at a later date. Um, when we talk about the, you know, the Quercus Alba versus Quercus Labrosque, um, American oak versus Spanish oak, and then we've got the Limousin oak in France, the actual chemical makeup of the cell walls of the different species of oak is going to influence the whiskey differently. And the big thing is how tight the grain is. When you look at a cross section of oak, the tightness of the grain is going to have a big impact on how well the, can you, are you kidding me right now? My daughter is on the call. Uh, how well the spirit can penetrate the barrel walls and allow the whiskey to age. So the uh, the vanillins and the different elements that are released when the whiskey gets charred, the more it gets charred, the more certain chemicals are released. So by keeping this with the younger, fresher flavors from the oak staves, it's going to have a much more specifically woody aspect, which you're going to get when you taste this. Cheers. Thank you, Brother Dan. I apologize. Again, I, I guess it's just I've had too much scotch. I can't bring bring my mute off. <laughs> um, so let's see here. That was scotch number four. So that brings up, we're going to have Worshipful Brother Dan Williams, who's the Worshipful Master of Amicable Lodge, number 664 of the Oneida Masonic District. And uh, Brother Dan, it's all you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Gracious hosts, distinguished guests, friends, brethren all. Uh, we have all this uh, poetry, today, so I figured I would uh, try my hand at it a little. Uh, forgive me. Uh, Slangeva, yucky da, prost, salute. Amicable toasts, health and love at their roots. Our gentle craft shall always remain, should we wish all good health and exemplify the same. To good health and happiness. Cheers. To good health and happiness. Cheers. Cheers. And uh, what an important toast this year, especially, right? To health and happiness. Uh, as uh, health issues around the world are definitely a concern. And uh, before we move into our next. Um, Next little item. I do want to take a second to just say, so uh, this is my first time to show off my new kilt. I got it, or this is a fly plate. I have the kilt on as 
as well. I'm not going to stand up. Um, but I got this uh, a while ago, and I'm really happy to, to show it off and to, to brag about it. So those of you wearing a tartan right now, go ahead and share in the, the, the chat what you're wearing. I'm currently wearing my, so I'm a Tweety, right? It's my surname, which is a sept of the Fraser clan. So I'm wearing the Fraser hunting weathered tartan, which I think is quite, quite dashing. I used to hate weathered, but I think it's just my fashion sense has changed, I suppose. So go ahead and share in the chat. What are you wearing? What's your tartan? Oh, I see Gus Campbell stand up. Gus, you got to unmute yourself and say something so everyone can see you. You're muted, Gus. We can't hear you. All right, I guess he's not going to unmute himself right now, but Gus, uh, you'll all see Gus soon. Don't worry, he's doing a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic burn. Oh, there he is, he's unmuted now. Can oh, you hear me now. Yeah, we can hear you now, Gus, go right ahead. Okay. It doesn't take much now. to know that my name's Campbell, so the tartan I'm wearing right now is Campbell. <laughs> I think it is anyway. Thank you. Oh, no problem. So Campbell, is that the one with the soup cans on it? or? <laughs> <laughs> Them's are fighting I mean, words. I will get you someday. <laughs> I will get you one. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but Campbell's definitely one of the the the, the largest and most well-known clans in in the Highlands. So very very awesome to have uh, brother Gus Campbell joining us and the Campbell. Uh, go. No, go ahead, Gus. Oh. Don't believe the Glencoe story. <laughs> Those of you that don't know the Glencoe story, do a Google search, but Gus says don't believe it. So <laughs> moving on to, ah, uh, we have a presentation right now by Wright Warshall brother, Anthony Prizia. Uh, I'm pretty sure I just pronounced your name wrong, Anthony, and I apologize. You, you did great. All right, great. And uh, I will say, uh, I've actually used this this uh, this company before, and I absolutely love them. It's where I got my first uh, skiing do, which I've now lost. But go ahead. <laughs> so before I start, I'll just want to show you. I'll show you my kill. I'll actually stand up. I know Nathan said he wasn't going to, but I want you to appreciate what Bob and Doreen have made for me. And let's just so you can see the full kilt. Oh. So, very impressed. So, my brothers, uh, distinguished guests, ladies, um, over the past 30 years, Bob and Doreen Browning have been operating um, the Kilt Maker's Apprentice in Highland, New York. And I come from a little lodge in Highland, and I used, drove past their, their store a hundred million times in my lifetime, never ever really gave it much thought until later in my Masonic life, I was offered the extreme privilege to become a member of the Royal Order of Scotland. And when I got there, uh, I noticed, I said, well, what is the dress code? Is a kilt necessary? And they said, well, you live in Highland, you need to go to the Kilt Maker's Apprentice. And then it dawned on me that the reason why they were in business is they're internationally known and world renowned. So then the question came and said, well, Prizia is not a very Scottish last name, so I did not have a clan. And at that point in time, I petitioned the Grand Lodge of Scotland to allow, um, to ask them to allow me to wear their tartan. And it took a few months to get that permission. Now, if you do not have a clan, like um, some of our brothers on the call tonight, there is a Masonic tartan. There's the Masonic law, um, law, um, law enforcement officer tartan. And there's a, a number of, of different tartans for all of our organizations that you can petition um, and ask permission to, uh, to, get, to get the uh, rights to wear that tartan. Now it does take around seven to nine yards, depending on how big you are. If you do have that Masonic profile, um, the tartans get a little more expensive and you actually pay by the yard. And the fun part I love about uh, wearing my kilt, and I always try to come up with a reason why I should wear it, is uh, you can wear these in lodge. And if you're one of the guys who always has a hard time with your jacket bunching up and you're putting your apron on over your jacket, which is, uh, and there's a picture right there of Doreen. She's an amazing person. So um, I can't thank her enough. Um, but you can wear your actual apron. It actually has a, a mini tails. So it actually makes it more comfortable when you're wearing your apron and you're sitting down in lodge. And when you are sitting down in lodge, 
if you're wearing your kilt proper, you must be careful who's sitting across from you because wearing your kilt proper means you do not wear anything underneath it. If you do wear something underneath your kilt, there's two things. One, we refer to it as a skirt. And two, if another kilt brother realizes that you are wearing something under your kilt, they have the rights to remove your kilt and take it. So I, I highly recommend you um, Googling the Kilt Maker's Apprentice uh, visiting her shop, if you can, once COVID does go away a little bit, and appreciate what she does, but also make sure that you wear, wear it appropriately. And um, for any of the ladies that are on the call, if you're looking for something you want to buy for, uh, for a, as a gift, remember, it's not just the kilt you need. You need the shoes, the socks, the garter, the kilt. Now the dirt. Now the dirk is a uh, is traditionally it is a dagger, um, but me being in the wine business, mine's a wine key. So my my dirk is a little wine key. Um, you you need a dress a dress shirt, a vest, a jacket, a tie, and then don't forget the sporin. Now the sporin you saw um, I think a little earlier you, you could actually see one of the other brothers had a sporin and it was made out of fur. Um, I'm allergic to every fur bearing animal, so I went with a more traditional dressy like little patent leather kind of a, a non-allergenic <laughs> sporin, which is your uh, man purse. But um, I'm again, I, I'm so uh, honored to be able to speak here and um, pass the amazing work that the Kilt Maker's Apprentice does, has done for me and many of the brothers here. And um, if anyone wants more information, please reach out to me. My email and my contact information is on Craftsman's Online uh, website. And um, I'd be more than happy to help you get in touch with the people who would uh, give you permission to wear a specific tartan. So thank you very much, brothers. And uh, I'm really honored to be here tonight with you guys. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, brother Anthony. And you shamed me into it. So here you go. <laughs> down a little bit here, like you said. Yeah, can we see the, we're going to see lower. Yeah. There you go. The phrase, you notice I got the square and compass on my, on my spore and I got the square and compass on my hip. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, so, um, oh, yeah. Ooh. all right. Yeah, uh, so uh, let's just do a quick run through of what I see in the chat. Uh, I see, let's see here. Ah, brother Ted Volkert is wearing the black watch of the Knights of St. Andrew of, uh, that's my Knights of St. Andrew. Uh, so yay, brother Ted, thank you for, also brother Ted was a founding founding member of the Knights of St. Andrew there. Member of Clan Urquhart. Urquhart Castle, by the way, is the castle in Loch Ness. Um, U.S. Coast Guard Tartan, which is absolutely gorgeous as well, I must say. Got uh, Tartan from Clan Montgomery. Uh, Kennedy, ancient. Ooh, that's a good thing to notice as well, right? So usually most most of the larger clans will have their traditionals, they'll have the, the, the huntings, and they'll have additional variants like weathered and ancient and all that stuff. Clan Gordon, uh, let's see, Morrison, uh, Grand Lodge of Scotland, Tartan. Uh, but yeah, looks like we got a decent mix. I'm sure I missed a few. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and just so those that are, uh, I actually have gotten a couple, a couple messages of brothers who are like, oh, I don't have a Tartan. Uh, every branch of the United States military does have one. Uh, obviously, oddly enough, the president has one as well. Uh, not that most presidents are going to wear a kilt, but there you go. Uh, so a little fact there. And uh, no, there is not a Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club clan, although that is an absolutely fantastic comment. Thank you for, uh, to, to, the other, uh, to Warshall Brother Dave Pritt for that comment, because I love a good pun. <laughs> All right, now we are closing up our evening here soon as we are closing in on the two hour mark. And this is one, our next poem is actually from brother Gus Campbell, uh, who you've all heard and seen so far already. He's from, brother, uh, from ancient landmark lodge number 358 in the Erie Masonic district. And uh, he's gonna be re reading the, uh, the farewell to the brethren of St. James Lodge of Tarbolton. And before brother uh, um, Gus jumps on, I just wanna give you a little background on this uh, poem. I mentioned earlier that he wrote several poems against slavery. Uh, and when he wrote this poem, he was going to leave Scotland and move to the Caribbean, where he was going to uh, take a position at the, uh, the 
plantation that his brother was working at as a, uh, as a bookkeeper. So a man who wrote multiple poems about, um, about ending slavery and abolition was about to go take a job on a slave plantation. Uh, so quite interesting and, and duality there uh, within Burns' life. But this is the poem that he wrote and recited to the brothers of St. James Lodge in Tarbolton prior to his departure that never happened because of the success of his first book of poems. So with no further ado, no, brother, no better brother to recite this one, Brother Gus Campbell. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, brothers and guests. Uh, my name's Gus Campbell, past master of ancient landmarks 350 in Buffalo. Uh, normally we do have our own supper, our burn supper on this same evening. Uh, but because of the problems we have right now, we can't have it. Um, this poem uh, was written in 1786 by uh, Robert Burns. Uh, the following farewell is to sum the gem of Burns' Masonic poetry. It was written when, he, when his arrangements for leaving the country were complete. And he was in he was expecting to enter upon his journey immediately. His relations with the brethren of St. John's Lodge seemed to have been particularly enjoyable. And the parting would have been a sorrowful one for all of them. The separation, however, was spared them. But the farewell verses remain for the enjoyment of all Masons. Actually, he was going to the West Indies, as you just said, Jamaica, actually. A Jew, a heartwarming, fond adieu, dear brothers of the mystic tie, ye favored, enlightened few, companions of my social joy. Though I to foreign lands must hang, Pursuing fortune slitherly bore, with melting heart and brimful eye, I'll mind you still, though far away. Oft have I met your social band and spent the cheerful festive night, oft honored with supreme command, presided o'er the sons of light. And by that hieroglyphic bright, which none but craftsmen ever saw, strong memory on my heart shall write those happy scenes when far awar. May freedom, harmony, and love unite you in the grand design. Beneath the omniscient eye above, the glorious architect divine that you may keep the unerring line still rising by the plummet's law. Till order bright completely shine shall be my prayer when far away. And you farewell, whose merits claim justly that highest badge we wear, having blessed your honored noble name to masonry and Scotia, dear. A last request permit me here, when yearly ye assemble all, one round, I ask it with a tear, to him, the bard that's far away. Good night, and joy be with you all. Thank you, brother, uh, Orshel Brother Burr, for that. And I see multiple people are applauding you. Uh, uh, so very well done. And uh, as you said, this really is the, uh, the highlight of his Masonic poems. Uh, he alludes to Masonic ideals in multiple poems. Uh, he has some that are just straight up, here's your Masonic stuff right in your face. Uh, but this I'm very, one- I'm very, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that I was invited this evening. I don't know why you would have invited me. But you did, and I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate it, and uh, I wish you all the very best and safety for the new year. Thank you very much. 
thank you so much as well, Brother Gus. And uh, to Brother Gus is from the Erie Masonic District in New York. So to all the, those Western New York brothers that are Bills fans, sorry. Uh, but at least we got some history, right? With Tampa Bay being uh, the first team to, to play Super Bowl in their home stadium. So that's interesting. But, uh, um, but yeah, so the, sorry, brothers of, uh, of Buffalo for your team not going advancing to the, to the Super Bowl. Um, so let's see here. Uh, next up, brother, worshipful brother, Daniel Ekman with his final scotch tasting. But before we switch over to brother Dan, last call uh, for anyone who wants to enter our Nobby Knees contest. There's not many entries, so should be pretty easy to win. And I wasn't joking earlier when I said, snap a picture of your spouse. You know, if they're you know wearing a skirt or they're wearing shorts, just snap that picture, just send it to me. I'll put the link uh, or put the email address in the chat here in a second. Nathan Tweedy at yahoo.com. All right. Uh, just just before we proceed, I want to just state for the record as a publisher of Craftsman Online, there is no um, award. <laughs> you don't win anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I was going to say it's like the the winning uh, whose lines did anyway, where the points don't matter, or the points are made up, and the the winning doesn't matter. Yeah, so uh, uh, I was going to send you a very nice, you know, virtual high five was going to be the award, but uh, um, yes, there is no actual award to winning. So to that, uh, brother Ekman. Okay, so first of all, um, I also. I'm not Scots and therefore I don't have a tartan. So even though I've been working on getting one for a number of years, I actually bought a standard black walking kilt. So sort of the the cop out of kilts, but it uh, it gets the job done and it goes with everything. Um, so for our fifth and final whiskey of the evening, uh, we're going to be tasting one that got quite a lot of hoopla when it first came out and is now a little bit less exciting, but is still phenomenal. And approachable. Um, so the Peep Monster. And for those of you who ever had your first experience with scotch and tasted it and yeah, and then that was it. Um, a very long time ago, when whiskey was in the very early stages, in order to make the malt that is the malt part of the single malt, um, what you're actually talking about is taking barley and activating the sugars in it. In order to ferment anything, you need yeast to be able to digest sugar and excrete alcohol. Yeasts are tiny, tiny little microorganisms, so they can't actually fit complex carbohydrates into themselves. They need simple sugars, which is why wine predated beer by thousands of years, because the juice in the wine was easy to ferment. It's just free sugars, but grain, we know, is complex carbohydrate. So in order to malt barley, what you're actually doing is you're tricking the barley. You soak it until it thinks it's about to be a plant, and then it activates its own enzymatic process to break down the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars that the yeast can work with. But you don't actually want a plant. You just want malted barley. So then you have to kill the seed before it germinates into the plant. You want it to have started germination but not completed germination. And hundreds of years ago, they didn't have natural gas fired sealed kilns. So what they did was they would toast and smoke the soaked barley over whatever they happened to have to create a fire. And in the British Isles, the most abundant natural resource and source of fuel is peat. Peat is basically coal that forms above ground. Over the course of thousands of years, vegetation mashes together and dries out and becomes bricks of burnable stuff. But it has a very specific odor to it. And in the course of smoking the barley to prevent it from becoming a plant, you're infusing it with smoke flavor, just like if you were smoking brisket for barbecue. When you smoke the barley, that flavor infuses the grain, which then makes its way into the spirit. And for a long time, the really smoky whiskeys were things like Laphroaig and Ardbeg, which continue to be very smoky whiskeys. The way we measure these things, a very lightly peated whiskey might only be four or five ppm parts per million phenol. A very heavily peated whiskey like Ardbeg would be 50 parts per million phenol, 10 times as smoky. But for a long time, that was the ceiling until John Glazer decided he wanted to make something really aggressive and he made Peat Monster, which was 65 PPM 
at the time, this was a full third smokier than the smokiest thing anybody could get. And it blew the doors off the place. Some years later, Ardbeg came out with something called Supernova, uh, which was 300 ppm. And then, uh, you know, we've, we've got now other very specifically customized, heavily peated scotches that are north of 300 ppm. But at the time, this was about as peaty as it got. And it's probably as peaty as most people are willing to drink. And it's a blend of multiple peated malts. They don't disclose the specific ratios between them, but it's mostly distilleries that you've heard of. There are only eight distilleries on Isla, which is the home of where all the really peated whiskeys are, because Isla peat is the most desirable peat of all the peat in Scotland. Their bogs are deeper and funkier and older, so they make better smoky whiskeys. So when you try this one, it's going to have a very different nose than the other whiskeys that we're having tonight. Um, specifically because that phenol has a way of getting into your nasal passages and then just hanging out there. But um, there's a reason we're doing this last. And it's the sort of thing where, and I cannot stress this enough, if you have someone in your life and you're a scotch lover and they say, I've never really had scotch before, don't start them with Lagavulin. <laughs> you're not doing anyone a favor. They're not going to get into it. The head distiller at Lagavulin for 25 years used to keep a bottle of Glenfarclas in his office because if anyone came to Lagavulin and said, I've never had whiskey before, he said, don't start with mine. Um, but yeah, so this is the Peat Monster, comparatively very heavily peated blended malt. This is 46% alcohol rather than the 43 that we were getting from the earlier offerings. So you're going to find just a little bit more heat behind it, but it, it's really... Um, for as smoky as it is, it's absolutely lovely stuff. So, uh, slot of up. Mm. Gorgeous. Thanks everybody for participating who did participate. And uh, back to you, Nathan. Uh, I, if I just may say, um, Right Worship Brother Dan, it, it was so wonderful having you with us. Thank you oh, so thank very, you. very much. Brother Dan does, you know, does talks like this for his lodge and district, and, and he's just wonderful. And we want to thank you so much for, for participating with us this evening. You you certainly made the evening less painful. My pleasure. <laughs> yes, uh, certainly made the evening less painful. I can't even feel my, my, my lips right now. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, no, uh, as we are drawing to a close, we do have a few items left for the evening, but we are drawing to a close. Um, and again, thank you, Right Worshipful Brother Ackman, for your time, uh, as well as everyone else who's presented so far and will present this evening. Uh, it is time for the uh, Nobby Knees contest, uh, so please bear with me for a moment uh, as I struggle to share my screen here. Uh-oh, uh -oh, that's all I wanted. Um, all right, so <laughs> we tested everyone else that we had to do except for me, so let's see how this works. All right, let's see. Share. Are we seeing all right? There we go. All right. Everyone seeing my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. So the Navi Knees contest. First off, this is number one. Those are, that's what a, a winner. Of, <laughs> we have a pair of knees with what appears to be a Fraser Tartan. I can only tell you that because that is my clan. So yeah, Fraser Tartan there. And uh, there's another pair of knees with the square compasses there on the, uh, the hose. Very nice touch. We've got this gentleman here. A little too zoomed out to see his knees, but he's got a nice mini mouse there next to his knees. Ooh. Number four, this pair of knees. And I believe this is our last set of knees that have gotten in on time. If you got one in and I didn't get it, uh, I apologize. Oh, well, I have one more. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do it in time. I'm sorry, Tom. I know you sent them to me. I just got it. I can't get it in, in time. Um, Tom Lawton also sent in some some knobby knees. I just got it though, so my apologies, Tom. Um, so uh, all right, let's run through them again. This is number five. Number four. Number three, number two, and number one.
please vote for the knobbiest knees in the chat bar. So comment, please, only once. Honestly, it can only be a, a you know, honor system here. So vote once and uh, comment in the, the chat, which it looks like you already are pretty heartily. So, uh, all right, I'll... <laughs> Give me one second here before I move on. I don't even, uh, let me see here. Sorry. Bear with me, technological issues on my side, Te technological. All right, so, all right, so I will announce the winner uh, after, <laughs> hopefully, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna stop voting in five, four, three, two, one and we're done. All right, no more voting for the Nobius knees. I'll announce the Nobius knees winner hopefully uh, before uh, we finish off with all Lang Syne. That being said, our final toast of the evening: Worshipful brother Frank Storza. And please, brother, correct me when you get on if that's incorrect pronunciation of your surname. Um, <laughs> and uh, Worshipful brother Frank is the master of South Shore Long Beach Lodge, number. 1126 of the Nassau Masonic District. Now, I know a lot of you are from uh, central upstate all across New York. Nassau, that's that long island that's attached to the state that sometimes gets left off. That's way down there. So, uh, Brother Frank, please uh, please correctly say your, your surname. Good evening, everyone. My name is Worshipful Brother Frank Sforza. There we go. Then to our final toast tonight, our glasses freely drain. Happy to meet, sorry to part. Happy to meet again. Dear brethren of the mystic tie, the night is waning fast. Our work is done. Our feast is o'er. This toast must be our last. Good night to all. Once more, good night. Again, that farewell strain. Happy to meet, sorry to part. Happy to meet again. To all poor and distressed masons, wheresoever dispersed over the face of the earth or water, a speedy relief to their suffering and a safe return to their native land if they so desire. With me, my brethren, to all poor and distressed Masons. To all poor and distressed Masons. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, all right, and uh, I fully admit I'm, uh, give me one second. Oh, beautiful, there we are back on it. Uh, my, I'm using two screens and uh, I lost the, uh, the, the thing there. So uh, before our closing prayer by my worshipful master, um, we are going to announce the winner uh, in a landslide, surprising because I did not see this one winning. Uh, number one is our winner. Uh, number one is uh, Frank on your screens. So feel free to send him a congratulations. And um, yeah, Frank is actually my dad. And uh, <laughs> and those aren't knobby knees at all. No, they're not. But you all voted that they were. So so be it. Um, he got seven, uh, sorry, 16 votes too. So surprising. Uh, also, Frank's not a Mason. So feel free to, to bombard him with messages as to why he boo, should join the crowd. Boo, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, feel free to bombard him with why he should join. Um, but <laughs> now an eavesdropper. <laughs> so congratulations to Dad. Um, wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, and thank you all for voting. And uh, as we move on after the Nobby Knees contest, uh, I'm laughing, but we need to move on and change our tone a little bit to our absolute final toast of the evening. Uh, I take that back. Brother Frank just did that. Uh, so <laughs> no, sorry. No, we just did that. My apologies. So we are moving on to the closing prayer, as I uh, said earlier, with uh, Grand Chaplain, Right Worshipful Thomas Pulleyblank, who is also the current master of Otsego Lodge number 138 in Cooperstown, New York, as well as a Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge of the State of New York. So Right Worshipful Pulleyblank, please go ahead. So I'm basing tonight's benediction on a prayer commonly attributed to St. Columba. Um, he lived uh, 1300 years or so before Brother Burns and founded the Abbey at Iona. 
Um, the, the, the prayer attributed to Columbus is only a couple lines longer than the Selkirk grace. And I'm very confident that Brother Burns would share its sentiments. So pretty, please join me in an attitude of prayer, my brothers, for this blessing. See that you be at peace among yourselves, my brothers, and love one another. Follow the example of good men of old, and God will comfort you and help you, both in this world and in the world which is to come. Amen. 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 And uh, <clears throat> before we move on to our final presentation of the night, I just want to say, uh, right worshipful pulley blank, his lodge. Uh, the Bible that it was used for basically every meeting, as well as uh, every initiation, passing, and raising, uh, was uh, a Bible that was actually a contemporary of Brother Burns. Uh, it was published in the 1790s, and uh, up until very recently was being used regularly, and that's the, the Bible that I took my three degrees on, and uh, just given the age of that Bible and the topic of the evening, I thought it was quite appropriate uh, that being said, um, we're going to move on to our very final presentation of the evening, uh, and thank you for all of you who have joined us this evening, those of you who presented, joined in in the Nobby Knees contest, voted in the Nobby Knees contest, and uh, I just, this event was uh, born out of a post Craftsman Online uh, chat. It was, hey, why don't we do a Burns Night? And it grew into this event where we had just under 200 members, or 200 people uh, in our Zoom. I don't know how many were on Facebook or how many were watching on YouTube, but uh, just in Zoom, we were just under 200 people at one point. So uh, absolutely fantastic evening. And thank you to everyone, either uh, behind the scenes, Brother uh, RC, uh, Right Worshipful, um, Stephen Rubin, uh, everyone who promoted it online, everyone who uh, shared our, our images, our, our, uh, our links, and that being said, I, I'm so happy that uh, this event has gone off without any major hitches. We had some minor ones, but nothing major. Uh, so thank you to everyone. And with that, uh, no, with no longer ado, I present to you uh, brother and world-renowned tenor, Brother Barry Banks of Independent Royal Arch Lodge Number 2 of the 1st Masonic District. be forgot and never brought to mind should old acquaintance be forgot and all lang syne for all lang syne my joy for all lang syne Kindness yet for all lang syne. And there's a trusty horn, my fear, and geese a horn a And we'll tack a right good welly wacht for all lang syne. For all lang syne, my jo, for all lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for all lang And uh, as that was supposed to be our final presentation for the evening, um, I got a text from our publisher and I had the same question, Brother Dan Mort, are you still on? If so, I think we skipped you. So by all means, <laughs> Brother oh, Dan Mort. No, I'm here. No, I, I was taking advantage of uh, being skipped and had a mouthful of crackers. So that, 
the, the timing is awesome. <laughs> well, so our, our true finish to the evening, unexpectedly, because I skipped him, and my apologies, is Brother Dan Lort. And, uh, oh, I'm not skipping. So, Dan, please introduce yourself, because I can't find you quickly enough on our, our, uh, our schedule for the evening. Well, I'm Dan Lort. Uh, I hail from uh, the, uh, the uh, Niagara Orleans District and the, uh, in, in uh, Western New York, and currently the uh, Thousand Islands region, Jefferson Lewis District. Uh, that's who I am, and, and uh, I was kind of thinking, well, gee, I got skipped, so I don't know who dimed <laughs> that out, but um, and, and catch me with a mouthful of crackers, but I really appreciate it. So, but I do have a toast. Uh, if anybody, if there's any drinking men here, and I finished my scotch, so I do have a, I hate to say it, don't hate me, don't be a hater, I have a wine. <laughs> so, so please join me. May those who live truly be always believed, and those who deceive us be always deceived. Here's to the men of all classes, who through lasses and glasses, will make themselves asses. I drink to the health of another, and the other I drink to is he, in the hope that he drinks to another, and the other he drinks to is me. Cheers, brothers. Cheers, Cheers brother. And with that, brothers, I thank you all for coming and joining us guests. Thank you as well. Uh, this was a fantastic evening for me, and I hope you had a fantastic evening as well. And uh, with that, happy birthday, Robert Burns. Uh, let's celebrate Scotland more than once a year, and have a fantastic evening and a wonderful rest of 2021. Thank you. Next year in person. Next year in person. That's right. Absolutely. Well you done, brother. well, brothers.